Hi, welcome to Organic Chemistry. My name is Dr. English. Today we're going to be talking about understanding the basics of organic chemistry. Specifically, we're going to look at the basics of organic compounds, solubility of organic compounds, characteristics of organic compounds, saturated versus unsaturated bonds, single, double, and triple bonds, drawing structural formulas, and finally, writing condensed structural formulas. Let's start off by talking about the basics of organic compounds. Organic chemistry is based upon the element carbon. When carbon bonds to four atoms of another element or some combination of elements, a tetrahedral shape results, as you can see in the image on my screen. Carbon commonly bonds with other carbon atoms to form many different types of compounds. The resulting molecules can have a straight, branching, or ring shape associated with them. As you can see the diagram down here, which is a straight-chained hydrocarbon, or the other structure that is in the form of a ring. Hydrocarbons are compounds that contain only carbon and hydrogen. So if someone refers to a hydrocarbon, again, the only elements involved in that compound will be carbon and hydrogen. So we have two structures below, the one on my left, has three carbons and six hydrogens, and the one on my right has three carbons and four hydrogens. They might have different structures associated with them, but they would both be called hydrocarbons. Characteristics of organic compounds. They are generally nonpolar molecules, and we can see this in the image below. If we look at the electronegativity of hydrogen, which we know is 2.2, and carbon, which is 2.6. And then we draw polarity arrows from the element with a lower electronegativity to a higher electronegativity. We can see with every single one of these hydrogens here, another hydrogen is canceling them out. And if we do that for all of these, we can see that every single hydrogen has another hydrogen canceling it out. So therefore, this would be classified as a nonpolar molecule. In other words, no positive end or negative end. Nonpolar, no poles. Organic compounds are also classified as non electrolytes. In other words, they're not going to break down into ions. So, again, we look at the image below. This is not going to break down into a positive ion and a negative ion. Organic compounds typically have low melting and boiling points, and they have a slow reaction rate due to the strong covalent bonds that hold the molecules together. The solubility of organic compounds. Solid or liquid organic compounds that are nonpolar molecules do not dissolve, in other words, they're not soluble in water. Water, as we know, is a polar molecule with a positive end and a negative end. Polar molecules and nonpolar molecules do not mix together evenly. In other words, we'll have a heterogeneous mixture where we might have our organic compound up at the top where we see octane and on the bottom where we have a bunch of water molecules. The octane is nonpolar, while the water molecules are polar. And even though we might shake this up and it might look for a moment like they're combining together, in reality, they'll settle back out into two distinct layers. So polar and nonpolar molecules will not mix together evenly. Solid or liquid organic compounds that are polar molecules will dissolve in other words, they are soluble in water. For example, methanol, which is CH3OH, also more commonly known as wood alcohol, is a polar molecule due to the presence of oxygen in the compound. So this is methanol right here. We can see that this is a polar molecule because of the oxygen that's part of the molecule. The oxygen has two lone pairs, so those lone pairs make this slightly negative here and slightly negative here. We can form hydrogen bonds between these water molecules, between the slightly positive hydrogen and the slightly negative oxygen. Same thing down here, slightly positive hydrogen, slightly negative oxygen, and because we can form that strong intermolecular force between the methanol molecule and the water molecules, these will dissolve together. Now methanol, and we'll talk more about why methanol is called methanol, is not a hydrocarbon. It's not a hydrocarbon because it has more than just hydrogen and carbon. It has an oxygen in it, so it would not fall under the category of a hydrocarbon. But 
some organic compounds will dissolve in water if they have another nonmetal element like oxygen, nitrogen, or one of the halogens. Saturated and unsaturated bonds in organic compounds. Organic molecules that have only single bonds between carbon atoms are classified as saturated. So I know that hydrogen can only form a single bond between each carbon because hydrogen has one valence electron. It only needs one more to get its full octet. This bond right here between the two carbon atoms is a single bond. Therefore, this molecule is classified as saturated. Now let's talk about unsaturated bonds organic molecules that have one or more double or triple bonds between carbon atoms are classified as unsaturated. These tend to be more reactive than saturated compounds because more multiple bonds, the more reactive it will be. So we can look at the molecule on my left right here that has a double bond, therefore this molecule will be classified as unsaturated, and this molecule over on my right that has a triple bond, and therefore that would be classified as unsaturated. So to review, saturated means that all the bonds between carbon atoms are single bonds. Unsaturated means that either a double or a triple bond exists within the molecule between the carbon atoms. Single, double, and triple covalent bonds. Let's start off by talking about a single covalent bond, and this all should be review for you. A saturated hydrocarbon, like we just said, contains only single carbon to carbon bonds. Single bonds are represented with a dash and represent one electron pair. So let's look at a molecule that has two carbons and six hydrogens, and how we represent that as a Lewis dot diagram and as a structural diagram. As a Lewis dot diagram, I'd say, okay, here's my first carbon, and it has four valence electrons, one, two, three, four, and here's my other carbon, and it has four valence electrons, one, two, three, four, and then we have these six hydrogens. So I'm going to make a different symbol for my hydrogen to represent its one valence electron. So I'm going to go around, and now I have six hydrogens represented. I can see that with every electron pair that I circle, this is representing two electrons. So every electron pair is two electrons, including the electron pair between the two carbons. If I was to represent this as a structural diagram, I still have a carbon and a carbon, but that circled pair of electrons would now be represented as a dash. So I'm going to put dashes in for all of those electron pairs, and I'm going to put my hydrogens around here. And the important thing to notice here is that this is a saturated hydrocarbon. The bond between the two carbons is single, therefore it is classified as saturated. And all the bonds here would be classified as single covalent bonds. Now let's talk about double and triple covalent bonds. Unsaturated hydrocarbons that contain at least one multiple carbon to carbon bond. Double bonds represent two electron pairs, four electrons total, involved in the bond. So let's look at the molecule C2H4. So I'm still going to have two carbons, one, two, and they're each still going to have four valence electrons, one, two, three, four. But now I have four hydrogens to distribute. So I'm going to put hydrogen over here, farthest away from my bonding electrons, and another hydrogen over here, and for giggles I think I'll put a hydrogen down here and I'll distribute them evenly, and a hydrogen down here. Then I'm going to circle my electron pairs between the carbons and the hydrogens. And I can see that these are all going to be single bonds because they share one electron pair. The electron pairs that are shared between the carbons will now be a double bond. So these circled electron pairs between the two carbons represent two bonds. Let's see what this would look like as a structural diagram. So again, I'm gonna have a carbon, a carbon, a double bond that's representing those two circled electron pairs, and then a hydrogen over here, a hydrogen over here, a hydrogen going down, and a hydrogen going down. And this is a very simplistic model of a double bond that is existing between two carbons. What if we look at the molecule C2H2? Again, we'll start out with our two carbons. 
one, two, three, four, and another carbon, one, two, three, four, and then I have two hydrogens, so I'm going to put them here, that's one, and here, that's another, and I'm gonna circle this pair and that pair, and that's the single bond that's going to exist between the carbon and the hydrogen, and then I'm going to circle the electron pairs that exist between the two carbons, and as I can do this, I can see that I have three electron pairs representing a total of six electrons between these two carbons, which makes up my triple bond. So what does this look like as a structural representation? Again, I'll have my two carbons, one, two. The three circled red pairs will be represented by three lines, one, two, three. There's a bond that goes off to one hydrogen and a bond that goes off to another hydrogen. And now I have represented my triple bond, which represents six electrons, between my two carbons. Understanding structural formulas. The molecular formula shows the kind and number of atoms in a compound. So here we have a molecular formula, C2H6. This formula indicates that two carbon atoms and six hydrogen atoms are present in the compound. A structural formula, like you just saw me draw, shows the types and numbers of atoms of elements involved in the molecule but also the bonding patterns and approximate shape of the molecule, given that what we're writing here is a two-dimensional representation. So here is a representation of C2H6, where we have our two carbons and our six hydrogens represented in a structural formula. The following formula is glucose, a simple sugar. The empirical formula, which we know is the most reduced formula, is C1H2O1. The molecular formula, which tells us what we need to have in order to make the molecule, is C6H12O6. The structural formula is our actual structure of glucose. Now this is sort of an interesting representation of glucose because we have some condensed structural parts to this, which means like this area right here has sort of been scrunched together, and I'll show you in a minute how to do that. Same thing with our OHs, and that each intersection that we see right here, each of these intersections represents a carbon. So if you go through, you can count your six carbons. Now you might say, but look at this carbon right here. I only see three bonds coming off of it. That's also because they didn't include it, but there is actually a hydrogen coming off here, a hydrogen coming off here, a hydrogen here, a hydrogen here, and finally, if I'm correct, a hydrogen right here. So the complete structural formula for glucose would look something like this, but you might see in different places on the internet or in different textbooks, more simplistic structures of different organic compounds. So let's move on and talk about condensed structural formulas. A structural formula that shows a general shape of the molecule, but condenses atoms such as hydrogen, oxygen, and other elements around each carbon atom. Covalent bonds are assumed to exist within these condensed structures. This is a faster method of writing out organic compounds instead of drawing all of the covalent bonds between the carbon and primarily hydrogen atoms, which at times, I do admit, can get a little tedious. So let's look at an example. Let's look at the structure of propane. Propane looks like this. One, two, three, meth, eth, prop, and then we're going to put hydrogens all the way around it, which after a while, gets a little old, writing in all these hydrogens, you're sort of thinking to yourself, I can't stand it if I have to write in another hydrogen. The way a condensed structural formula works is that you take each carbon and you look at what's surrounding it. So let's take the carbon starting at the left. This carbon has this hydrogen, that hydrogen, and that hydrogen surrounding it. And then the next carbon has two hydrogens attached to it, and then the last carbon has another three hydrogens attached to it. So if I was representing the condensed structural formula for this, I'd write something as follows. I would write CH3 to represent that first carbon and the three hydrogens surrounding it, CH2 to represent that middle carbon and the two hydrogens attached to that, and finally CH3 
three to represent the last carbon and the three surrounding hydrogens that are attached to it. So what did you learn in this tutorial? We went over some of the basics of organic compounds. Then we talked a little bit about the solubility of organic compounds, which we'll talk about more in the future, characteristics of organic compounds, saturated versus unsaturated bonds, single, double, and triple bonds, which was more of a review than anything, drawing structural formulas, and finally, a little bit of writing condensed structural formulas, which we'll do more in the future. Need more help? Feel free to contact me. Have a great day.